pursuant to the general provisions, Article 3-305 and 3-104, the Board of Education of Queen Anne's County met in a closed session to have a finance department update, review the monthly human services resources report, discussed a personnel matter, the discipline of an employee, and reviewed the board handbook, and discussed ethics panel member term expiration. All right, thank you, Ms. Bennett. Uh, approval of the agenda. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve the agenda as presented. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Approval of the minutes for the October 18, 2023 open session. Mr. President, I move to approve the minutes from the October 18 open session as presented. Second. Motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Dr. Salins. Yes, awards. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, good evening. We have lots of awards this evening. So our November is a very special month because we have two winners for the Energizer Bunny Award. The Energizer Bunny Award is given to a staff member or a volunteer who keeps on going. It is sponsored by Bayview Financial, Mr. Chip Brittingham and Mr. Wayne Humphreys, if they could bring both of their bunnies up. <laughs> they said it was hard to wrangle two. They're only used to doing one. <laughs> they had to wrangle those two. And I'd also like for Mr. Bell to come up, our supervisor of fine arts. So the Energizer Bunny Award is the award that is given to a staff member who volunteers and keeps on going, as I said before. And this November Energizer Bunny is being presented to Mr. Peter Pucci, Executive Director of the Carol Casio Fund for Mind Movement Dance Connections. If he could please come forward at this time. This award goes to Peter, who, as I said, is the executive director for the Carol Casio Fund for Mind Movement Dance Connections. Peter is renowned for his choreography on Broadway and in dance companies worldwide. He's also been instrumental in fostering partnerships between our dancers at both high schools, facilitating movement workshops for our teachers and enriching the dance, music, and theater arts programs in our middle and high schools. Peter has amplified the importance of dance and has also fostered positive collaborations between Michael Bell, our supervisor, and the dance and theater teachers within Queen Anne's County Public Schools, CCBC, and Chesapeake College. With Michael and Rob Thompson at Chesapeake, he's helped launch Chesapeake College's first annual arts festival. And even tomorrow, he's organizing master classes at Centerville Middle School and Queen Anne's County High School, plus the entire day of dance at Chesapeake College on Saturday, November 4th. Whew. <laughs> yeah, despite how busy his schedule is shuttling between New York City and our local communities, Peter is certainly carrying forward Carol's legacy, a Ken Island resident who devoted her life to the nurturing of young artistic talent. His tireless dedication makes him the perfect embodiment for, of the Energizer Bunny and a valuable arts partner for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. And you can also visit carolcasiofund.org for upcoming collaborations. So congratulations. As I said, um, this month is extra special because we have a another Energizer Bunny. And I'd like to invite up at this time, Chrissy Gilberto, which is our Queen Anne's County High School Special Education Department Coordinator. <laughs> so um, Chrissy was actually nominated by Catherine Stamler. Is she? 
other way around. Sorry, 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 sorry. Um, so Mrs. Gilberto says that Catherine, who I'd like to invite up as well, or she's here, but I'd like to invite up the nominee. <laughs> sorry. Thank you. <laughs> So there. <laughs> right. I was like, wait, you have me so confused. I don't mean it. I was so confused. I apologize. Yes. Yes. Okay. So Catherine is the backbone of Queen Anne's County High School Special Education Department. She does it all and is always on the go. Nobody works harder than Catherine. Catherine is an extraordinary person who consistently goes above and beyond for both the teachers and the students. She creates a positive and warm atmosphere within the department and school. Catherine's dedication is evident in her willingness to assist teachers, Queen Anne's County High School administration, and the special education administrative team at the board level. Not only does Catherine perform her job responsibilities to the highest degree, she also has an unwavering dedication to all of her students' successes. Catherine spends countless hours lending a listening ear and a helping hand to our students. She provides them with a sense of comfort and reassurance that makes their day a little bit brighter and happier. Her exceptional organizational skills and attention to detail make her an invaluable asset to the special education team as she effortlessly schedules meetings, supports our Peels and PACS classrooms, communicates with parents and guardians, provides small group accommodations, and checks in with students, just to name a few. Catherine's commitment to the well-being and success of both teachers and students sets her apart as an exceptional educator, teammate, and friend. Congratulations. Okay, our next award, um, we also have several Shining Star Awards for the month of November. The Shining Star Award is presented to an individual or individuals in our school system who shine. The first November Shining Star Award has been nominated by Rebecca Loveday, Ken Island High School Special Education PACS teacher. She'll please come forward. Okay, so Jolene's gonna come forward for us. <laughs> our supervisor, thank you. So at this time, I'd like to um, call up our November Shining Star, Katie Peternell, who is a behavior specialist. <laughs> Ms. Loveday says, my nomination for the Shining Star is Katie Peternell. She is always smiling and attentive to the PAC students and teachers. She is knowledgeable about each student and is apparent, it is apparent how much she enjoys her job. She is able to balance her career and home life with style. Katie stands out above. I enjoy each time we are able to collaborate and plan for the needs of our students and to elevate my plans for the students. She truly is a shining star. Congratulations, Katie. Our second November Shining Star has been nominated by Mrs. Becky Tubman, principal at Graysonville Elementary School. If she'll please come forward. And the second November Shining Star is the GES Pre-K team. So if Lindsay Campbell and Laura Dean would please come forward. <laughs> Yes, 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 absolutely. You were, you were hiding back there. I didn't even see you. Mrs. Tubman says that Mrs. Lindsay Campbell and Mrs. Laura Dean have both successfully navigated pre-K accreditation while also implementing Frog Street curriculum and best practices during instruction. A big task for sure. Um, both teachers go above and beyond to meet the diverse needs of their students while differentiating and making learning fun. They take on challenges with a smile, collaborate with others, and take on many extra responsibilities such as participation in family engagement events. Their lessons go above and beyond county requirements, adding creativity and igniting a spark within all of their students in which all of their students can't wait to be at school and embrace learning. In an honor to work, it is an honor to work with such enthusiastic, dedicated, and inspiring educators who go above and beyond in all they do. Thank you. So. Thank you. 
Okay, the Queen Anne's County Public School Spirit Award. This award is given to an individual or individuals who embody the spirit of Queen Anne's County Public Schools. Again, oh, she st you guys stayed up here. That was good, thank you. <laughs> the nominee, Becky Tubman. <laughs> um, so our November Spirit Award winners are a co-teacher team, Dana Kemp and Christy Wilson, if they'll please come forward. And Ms. Mrs. Tubman says that Mrs. Dana Kemp and Mrs. Christy Wilson are an exemplar model of a highly effective co-teaching team. As the general educator and the special educator, they work hand in hand to meet the wide variety of instructional and social emotional needs of their students. Together, they create a dynamic partnership in which they respect and trust one another, clearly identify their roles and responsibilities, play in collaboratively, communicate daily, and create a daily classroom environment where their students feel happy, safe, successful, and loved. It is an honor to work with two positive educators who energize one another and their students while inspiring even their leadership team. Just so you know, Mrs. Kemp has a student here to support her. Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Congratulations. He was safely out the door. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Board involvement. Would any member of the board like to be recognized? Well, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge we had the passing of two citizens this past couple weeks that did a lot for Queen Anne's County Public Schools. One of them was Mr. Charles Nesbitt, was a teacher, a mentor, and a role model at Queen Anne's County High School and it really uh, did a lot for a lot of children in our school system. And also Mildred Casey, which was a, served on a lot of county committees, two-term board member. Uh, we're gonna miss them. They did a lot for Queen Anne's County over the years. Miss Casey, in about four months, would have been 100 years old. And Mr. Nesbo was in his mid-90s. But uh, I, I must say, uh, I'll miss him. I had one as a teacher and one as a, as a board member. So it was, it was, it was fun. Thanks, Dick. I just want to say um, thank you to everybody in the community or within the school that was able to put on fall festivals or the trunk or treats uh, for the kids at the school that may not otherwise been able to experience or celebrate anything. So thank you for everyone that helped out and volunteered with those. 
I'd Anybody like else? to um, recognize both football teams. We had a good game on Friday night. Um, <laughs> both teams behaved very well. They played very well, and it was just good to see everybody else supporting both teams. All right. Well, I just want to say that um, Miss Kenna put on an amazing fall thing festival uh, this past weekend. It was full of really great vendors. There was music. There was uh, a little dancing, some food. It was really a good time. So that was that was fun. Okay, uh, we have our student board members, Miss Forty. What you got? Hi. <laughs> um, so this month in November, our Interact Club at Queen Anne's is running Operation Christmas Child. And it's just a program that allows students to sponsor a boy or girl living in impoverished countries so they could receive toys or toiletries or any necessities that they need that they otherwise couldn't afford. And um, on November 17th, they will be collected from the classes and shipped all over the world. And it counts towards service learning credits for Queen Anne's County High School students. And November 2nd, our first quarter ends and it's an early dismissal for all the students. And our SAT registration deadline for the December SAT is also November 2nd. And winter sports, we'll be having free physicals for winter sports at Queen Anne's County High School. And November 3rd is the professional development day and the non slash non duty day and there's no school for the students. And November 4th, we have SAT testing for students at Queen Anne's County. And um, November 6th, the Future Business Leaders of America and the Business Honor Society will be having their, or starting their canned food drive. And many local pantries are stocked from this drive each year. So it just helps provide some food for some people. And um, the Navy is also giving a presentation for students from 9 a.m. to 10.30 a.m. on November 6th. And it's for STEM, or students interested in STEM who are juniors or seniors. And November 10th, our quarter one report cards will be sent home. And the fall, or it's the opening night for the fall play, the arsenic and old lady, or old lace, sorry. And it's at six o'clock on Friday and Saturday. Um, and November 13th, the spring semester registration day for Chesapeake College for any students interested in dual enrollment. And November 14th, we have our North County Inner Coral sing along at 6 p.m. And it's just over 250 students from the middle schools and elementary schools will be performing in this sing along. November 15th, um, winter sports, the first day for winter sports, and the fall ASVAB test for juniors in English three classes, and the FAFSA information night at 5.30 p.m. And on November 17th, it's the last day for seniors to choose their yearbook photos, and it's the day that we're co collecting the Operation Christmas Child boxes. And November 18th is another date for the fall play, the arsenic and Old Lace at 6 p.m. And then November 19th is the fall play matinee at 2 p.m. And November 21st is the last day for seniors to submit their senior quotes for the yearbook. And November 22nd, our Thanksgiving break begins. And then on December 1st, Salisbury University will be at our school um, for on-site college admissions. And it's also the day for the Christmas parade. That's all we have. A lot going That's on. A lot. <laughs> yeah. It sure is. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you. Mr. Sandifer is uh, not available tonight, or he couldn't make it. So I think Dr. Kibler, you're going to read a statement. Sure. So he wants everyone to know. So again, he's from Ken Island High School. Uh, the fall <laughs> play starts on Friday. The fall playoffs are underway, and the girls' soccer team are regional champions as they yes. defeated Queen Anne's County High School last night, three to two, in do double overtime <laughs> with the game-winning goal by Caroline Cavanaugh. Um, he says, our football team, so again, I'm reading for him, uh, <laughs> uh, shut out Queenie Anne's last Friday, 30 to zero. Mm -hmm. uh, their staff participated in a half day professional development uh, focused on how to support students' social emotional well being. Apprenticeship week is later this month, and Ms. Hessen, uh, the new career coach, has a ton of activities and visitors planned to promote the workforce engagement. And he also wanted everybody to know that many seniors are submitting applications today for early acceptance into colleges and universities. All right, thank you, Matt. Uh, Dr. Sands. Oh my goodness, it's been a busy month for sure. I had to actually write it down this time, but there was uh, um, some amazing school visits, been able to get to all of the secondaries and many of the elementaries. Um, so it's always great to be in classrooms. Um, I was able to get to the Queen Anne's County High School versus Ken Island 
high school um, volleyball game, just both teams so impressive. The skill level is beyond me. Um, both of them did an amazing job. The YMCA grand opening was fantastic oh, yes, and yes, such yes. a huge impact on this community that I couldn't go without saying. So the state teacher of the year gala was amazing. Many of us were able to participate. And um, last but not least, um, I was able to tour the Kennard African American Cultural Heritage Center. I met President Washington there. And um, what just an amazing, rich history right here in our district that I wasn't even aware of. And we're gonna be creating a new partnership to have some of our students be able to utilize that facility and learn more um, about the history of our district. So it was busy. It was fun though. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Outstanding. Um, citizen participation. Do we have anybody? We do. It's on it. Okay, uh, we ask that all speakers keep in mind the following guidelines. Speakers should sign the roster, include their telephone number and address. Comments should be limited three minutes. Limited to three minutes in length. Comments longer than three minutes should be submitted in writing. Statements to the board should relate to a matter of general policy over which the board has authority. Comments about actions or statements of individual staff members are not appropriate for public comments and should be referred to the superintendent of schools or the board president. If you have specific questions, the board will make sure an appropriate staff member responds to your question. The board respects your desire and right to convey your message freely, but ask as a courtesy to this board and our citizens that you show respect for all. First on the list and only Mr. Richard McNeil. Good evening, Richard McNeil. I uh, live in Centerville and represent, a, uh, among other things, myself and the retired educators and school personnel group. Um, I wanted to uh, go along with Mr. Smith that uh, with the passing of uh, Charlie Nesbitt, longtime coach and good friend, um, just I had the opportunity to teach alongside of him or in the same building for a number of years and coached uh, in a different sport, but we were together that way. And even afterwards, he was uh, always around here in the community, uh, carrying on conversations and supporting things. So it was just just a good man. And, uh, and of course, Mildred Casey um, had opportunity to uh, work with her on a couple projects and, and come alongside of her. And, and she, you know, even when uh, she was represented by this board, not too many months ago uh, and honored uh, her cheerfulness and uh, her enthusiasm for the schools, the, the staff, the students, everybody, uh, even though she didn't work here in the county, as far as the schools go, she supported it 100%. And uh, we just going to miss sure. those two great folks. Um, from our group, uh, just wanted to let everybody know that we had a wonderful uh, luncheon in October, uh, where we did two projects, and one of those we decorated uh, about 27 pumpkins to which we uh, distributed to the nursing home, to the facility over there, and all the patients. And um, if you if you were to go in there now, they're still there. It's starting to get a little squishy here and there, but you know <laughs> that happens. But a uh, lot of fun for that. We also um, one of our projects for the schools for that month. Uh, was to collect bottles of water, cases of water for all the nurses uh, at the schools. And each school, uh, we collected enough for each school to have uh, two cases uh, for each of the nursing um, stations and three for the high school. We just figured there's more at the high school, so we're not trying to do anything different on that part. But um, it was just a great time. Uh, we're looking forward to uh, and we were recognized again at the uh, state board for our programs here in the county. Um, uh, not the state board of board, but the state retirement group. I'll make sure I get that right. Uh, we were recognized again for Queen Anne's County for our participation and the number of folks that we have who are enthusiastically in joining that. So uh, we appreciate that and the hard work that we do. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, no other speakers? No, sir. Moving on to information items 6.01, audit report, Ms. McKendra. Audit 
Secretary, just to let you know, the board does have a copy of both of these in their possession. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> and good evening. <laughs> good evening. Thank you for having me. <clears throat> um, just to give you a little background, so I'm here to present the fiscal year 23 audit. We typically start our audit work in May or June of each year and then come back in usually late August and September to finish up field work. MSD has a deadline of September 30th for these financials to be issued. And I'm pleased to report that we did meet that deadline this year, so. Great, thank you. Sure. <laughs> um, the first page I wanna draw your attention to is the page number three in the financials. So this would be in the, it says audited financials the on the front. One. It's the thicker one, correct. And so on page three, under the opinion section, second paragraph where it says in our opinion the financial statements referred to above present fairly in all material respects the respective financial position of the governmental activities each major fund and the aggregate remaining fund information of the board of education of queen anne's county maryland as of june 30th 2023 that means you received a clean opinion we found no issues that we needed to report to you this is the best opinion that you can receive and please feel free if anyone has any questions Feel free to interrupt me. Um, the next page I'm gonna have you turn to is page six. And that is an additional report on our um, report on internal control over financial reporting and on compliance. Again, with this report, we found no issues that we felt we needed to present to you. It's a clean opinion. And then the next section, which starts on page eight, is the management discussion and analysis. And this section is just an opportunity for management of the board to um, provide their insights on what happened during the year in more of a layman's type terms than in the actual financials. I'm going to jump forward to page 18. And on page 18, so the your financials have actually two sets of financial statements. They have a set of government-wide <laughs> financial statements, which are on a full accrual basis, and then you have government fund financial statements. So the first two statements are the government fund. The first statement is the statement of net position, and that's similar to a balance sheet. And the difference between this and the fund financials are basically this statement reports your fixed assets, so your buildings, buses, those types of items. It also re reports long-term liabilities. And what primarily is in that category is your OPEB liability and your pension liability. And you'll see on here, your cash at the end of the year was at about 15.7 million with a net deficit of about 92 million, which is really strictly related to that OPEB liability is extremely high, so. Jumping to the fund financial statements on page 20. Again, this is the balance sheet without those fixed assets or the long-term liabilities. And again, you'll see your cash at about 15.6 million, your total cash. And if we go all the way to the bottom into the total fund balance, you'll see that your total fund balance um, for the general fund food service and then your non-major governmental funds, which would be your school construction and your schools, the student activity funds, you have a total fund balance of approximately 7 million. Last year it was sitting at about 11 million. Um, and you can see the biggest decrease was in your general fund, which last year was about 8.1 versus 4 million this year. And of that, 1.3 million is unassigned to be used for whatever needs you may have. The change in fund balance on page 22 kind of just details your revenues and expenditures for the year. And then following that statement on page 24 is your fiduciary funds, which is your um, retiree health plan trust fund. That's a fund that's set up to accumulate funds for future OPEB cost. And then you also have a custodial fund for the regional education funds, which aren't funds of the county. The next section in the financials are the notes to the financial statements that start on page 26 and run through page, I believe, run through page 50. I would be happy to go over any of these. There were no significant changes to these notes during the year from prior years. So if anybody has a question, I'd be happy to answer it. Otherwise, I am going to skip to the statement on page 52, 
which is the budget to actual expenditures in the general fund. And one thing I want to note, at the time these financial statements were issued, there was an additional budget amendment needed for some of the expenditures that were over budget. Um, so I'm going to strictly just talk kind of about your actual in, on these. You'll see that your actual revenues for the year were at about $121 million. Actual expenditures were at about $124.5 million. So there was revenues over in expenditures of about 3.7 million at the end of the year. 2.4 million of fund balance had been budgeted to cover that shortfall, which left a remaining shortfall of about 1.3 million at the end of the year before any additional budget amendments. And then the rest of the supplementary information here is really about your pension and OPEB. Um, and then there's notes to that. And then there's supplementary information um, that starts on page 61, which details out similar to the front statements, your non-major governmental funds, the capital projects and school activities. And after that, um, we can talk about, that's really all I have for the financial statements, unless someone has a question. Just because I probably missed something, because of these numbers, how you carry them over and liabilities for insurance purposes. Our fund balance that we keep from year to year is inside our policy. What is the exact number did we come in last year? When you say 1.3, was that what we? So as uh, what the fund balance from the government wide perspective, from the government fund perspective, your fund balance in total was about 4 million, about let me let me find it so I can give you the correct information. Okay, so your total fund balance on this is on page twenty for the general fund was at four million. Mm -hmm. Thirty two thousand of that is non spendable. So if you look up to the top where you have inventory, that's where we get that number from. And then there is an assigned fund balance, which if you look on page 50, it details out what makes up that assigned fund balance. Okay. Part of that is assigned for future insurance costs. Part of that is for encumbrances that are going to be paid for in fiscal 24, but were there were purchase orders cut for those in fiscal year 23. And then there was also a portion of fund balance um, related to um, accrued leave. So where individuals have accrued time off mm -hmm. that they would get paid for if they- That's accrued in there, it's already, if they didn't, if they took it all, we'd be- You uh, would have to pay that out. Now the odds of that, so, so the total fund balance was 4 million, 2.7 million is assigned for encumbrances, leave, that type of thing, which leaves about 1.3 million of unassigned fund balance at the end of the year. The other report that we issued was the audit communications, which is the smaller report. And again, we found no issues. This is standard verbiage for this. We found no issues that we felt that we needed to report to you in this. Um, I will mention there is one other report we will issue. So we do testing of your federal award expenditures. And we are in the process of wrapping that up now. We have found no issue, so we anticipate a clean opinion on that. That is due to MSDE by December 31st. All right, any questions? No, that was pretty thorough. Yep. And uh, clean opinions. Clean opinions. Yep, we like that. Nothing further. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sure. And I would just like, just let me, I would like to say very much thank you to um, the superintendent and the entire finance staff. It was a interesting and great year. We got a good audit, so <laughs> thank you. All right, thanks again. Thank you. OK, 6.02, mathematics update, Ms. Smith. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Yep. Good evening, Mr. Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, board members, and executive team. I'm Amy Smith, Supervisor of Curriculum Instruction for K-12 Mathematics and Gifted and Talented. And sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. You're okay. I thought You're it was good. already there. Sorry. Um, and I'm here to give you some mathematics updates for 
um, just some information and kind of where we are in our data and um, the, the trends that we're seeing, some of our curriculum and instructional focus now as we've moved kind of out of pandemic and really starting to look um, at data that we can now start to build off of because it really has been kind of a, a lull of data components of where do we go next and now, now we have some places to be able to make some decisions and some movement on. Um, so you saw from doc, Dr. Kibler last month the state data trends so that you could see kind of where the state has been in the course of the last several years. The 2019 data, and you of course see some significantly higher bars overall, that was pre-pandemic. It was the last of the assessments that were on old platform in old status mode. Um, and where we were or where the whole state was. And then you can see the, the sequence of the following year um, when we came right out of pandemic and we had some of the diagnostic issues and now last year's set of data. Dr. Kibler also shared with you our current QA CPS trends. So you can see that in 2019, we were looking pretty well and we were significantly higher than the state in the whole scope of where we were in MCAP across the board at all of our grade levels. And, and what we need to also note is that prior to the pandemic, we were on one set of testing platforms and now after pandemic, we have gone through two shifts, different tests, different platforms, different views. So while yes, we're dealing with similar standards, this testing itself is significantly different. Plus we are now coming out of and actually being able to build and move students forward with some of the, the different learning components that they had during virtual learning experiences and then when we initially brought all students back. So the state requested for all counties to really look at their cusp data. And what that is, is that is the students that were in a one to two question barrier from making to the proficient level. And so as we're talking about the tests themselves, what I wanted us to note is that our ranges of test scores have varied greatly from where, again, pre-pandemic to now. So at the initial point of the before pandemic had started, the proficient scale was 725 on our assessment and students could score a three, four or five and be classified as proficient. Now with our new MCAP assessments, our proficient scores are 750, which may not sound like a huge leap in points, but now we only have four score ranges. So when you're talking about going from a three range of being proficient to now two scores range and that that cut bar is at 750, it does make a significant amount of the number of students that fall within each of the bar categories. Um, the other piece of this is that in these cusp data is what the state shares is that the students that are on this cusp of being from a two to a three mark, for the most part, it's one or two questions. And so I want you to also understand the types of questions our students see mathematically. There's a multiple choice question where they're gonna select one correct answer. So it's right or it's wrong. There's also multiple select questions where a student may have to select two, three, or up to four correct answers in their question um, prompt that they've seen. And what is important about that is if they get two of the three correct answers, it's wrong. They don't get partial points in mathematics. It's a one point or no point. And so if they happen to get two of the three correct, they're still going to show as zero performance on that assessment item. Is, is that the way it was pre? And in Park, it was also that way. But the difference between Park and where we're at right now with MCAP is Park was significantly longer and had more assessment items. So when a student may have missed one of those multiple select answers, they actually had more opportunities to show understanding in their standards. Now, because of meeting some of the testing time requirements, MCAP is shorter 
has um, less questions that address each of the standards. And in some cases, as I'm looking at our county's data, I can look at each grade level and see that there were three to four questions potentially at each grade level that no student even saw in our county. And while we are a smaller district, and I understand that, I don't understand how I can go through a grade level and have one to three questions not seen by any student in the county to have a better understanding about where we are in our standards. And has that has that's changed over the last year or two? Yes. So last year we came in and the test, I, let me go back, two years ago, they came in and they changed the platform of the test. We went from PARC to MCAP. Um, some of the items were still within our bank, so they were PARC type items. A lot of the items were brand new, so they were going through field reviews and testing and getting um, leveled out to see was it a good question, is it appropriately testing. And so that test looked one way. Then last year the test became adaptive and so the platform was different again and changed in what how kids answered questions as well as how they interacted with the platform. And again, now the questions had to go through a different range finding skill set because now when they answered a question one way or another, it determined what question sets then followed for them. So we've had three different platforms and three different ranges of scores that we are being determined where our kids fall within our standards. You know, I try not to be a conspiracy theory, but well, you know, we, we go through this pandemic, pandemic, we have problems, we know we have loss, and then we change our ways we measure stuff, and then you sit there and everybody tells us, well, it's not the same in this. Well, how are you ever going to, I mean, if you ran a business like this, you'd be out of business. So that's a challenge that we have, and we're doing the best that we can. I'm not and blaming you. I mean, No, just, I but, understand, and, and I... Um, I also want to share with you is I am I try to be very vocal at the state level in regards to best practices for students. So I have purposely accepted any and every invitation. So there may be some things like specifically around the test that I can't necessarily say or answer in great detail because I have been on range finding for elementary, middle, and high school level tests. I have been on standard setting. I have been on item review. I have been on the presentation to de determine where are gonna be the cut scores for this last year to determine what was actually that 750 score um, on the behind scenes. And so I, I try my hardest in this role to be upfront at any opportunity that we have to talk about what is good practice for students and what is really evaluating appropriately. Um, and so like we as supervisors are constantly discussing, particularly like these multiple response questions that how are we really evaluating a student when they get two of the three correct answers right and we, we give them no validity to say you are on track of there, you just haven't quite seen everything that could occur. We are under um, new leadership at that level since the pandemic that could equate for why there's so many changes in the type of testing that we do because there's a I've had three different yeah rounds of leadership now in the last two years so yeah so so when we look at our customers I nominate you <laughs> oh no but thank you I appreciate okay. that um <laughs> I went, um, as we're looking at our CUSP data, so you can kind of see where we are in comparison to the state. And so again, when you look at where state percentages of CUSP students that are, are on the line, we are in a better spot. We do have a higher percent of students that were like one or two questions away from making that proficient mark of their 750 at their grade level. Um, and so, our, our biggest interest in all honesty is, I know, grade eight in algebra one. Grade eight is what sets the scene for the students that are going to need that algebra one towards a CCR endorsement. And then algebra one, because that is where they get their CCR endorsement for high school. 
The other piece that I want to mention in that is when you talk about pre-pandemic, that score of a 725 in algebra, students had to receive or they would not walk with a diploma. If they did not receive the 725, they had an opportunity to have another course set and a bridge plan to work them to get to a 725. And if they didn't make it, that bridge plan helped as their accreditation to earn their endorsement for their math component at the state level. Now, the 750 is not currently any tie to their graduation. And so there is in that developmental mind of students sometimes that they don't see how does that directly tie to my life walking down. I have to take the exam. Um, and they know very much so that while our desire is 750 and we're supporting them and trying to get them to that place so that they earn that CCR endorsement, they don't always see the direct link because before they knew if I didn't get this score, I didn't get my diploma either. Um, and so right now there's not a definitive talk as far as when a score is in place. Um, but I think that does have a little bit of, of mindset of what is important to an individual when I have some choices of what's going on and when I'm taking four or five statewide tests at the same time. So, When you specifically look at our grade level, Dr. Kibler showed you this graphic before, um, so you can see where our our numbers of students that were falling in our level three, which is proficient mark, and level four is that um, above the above proficiency advanced mark for us. And we did not have a huge number of students that fall, fell into that advanced group um, this past year. And a lot of that, again, I think has to do with just a little bit of the capacity of still filling some of those gaps. The piece that we did share, um, Oh, and I, I threw in that extra piece of data that that shows you our number of students that were on the cusp. And so when you're looking at those level two focus, that's really the focus area, that group of students, had they answered one more question or had they given a little bit more detail in a constructed response or had they gotten all three versus two in a multiple response, they would have been shifted into a level three proficient. Um, and and that's, a, that's a good part to know that we have a lot of students that are really ready to move. It's just a matter of helping them see some of the, the nuances within the test and understanding what the questions are asking and how they want them to, to be responded to. So we had our, our iReady diagnostic progress. And when I submitted this presentation, I um, did not have this information. So I'm really excited to get to share with you some more information about our iReady diagnostic. Two weeks ago, I was um, invited to attend the iReady Leadership Symposium. They had asked me to present and I was like, absolutely, I would love to present and, and talk to the different districts in our New York, New England, down to Virginia span about some of the things that we are doing here in Queen Anne's. Well, then when they presented, they presented Queen Anne's as an example, and I didn't even realize that we were gonna get noted because what we have found is now that we've had iReady here as a diagnostic um, for a two-year span, they could actually report a two-year progress and nationally, in all of their data, the typical students making a two-year stretch growth, which means they were getting more than a year's growth in their learning span, was typically around 15 to 20%, and we were at 35% of our students that had made a stretch growth mark. And what that does is when you look at where we were in the fall last year, and you can see that 54% of our students were, um, or sorry, 26% of our students were down either three or more or two or more 
grade levels below, by the end of one year, we had significantly decreased our students that were still below grade level by the end. And so as we're looking at this stretch data and knowing what that gets us for our students, our students are so close. And this year when we took our diagnostics, while yes, you see red in our fall diagnostics, that's at their grade level. The majority of our students are following in this yellow band and our red band is significantly smaller from last year where we started. That means they are ready to be at grade level instruction. And so I am very excited about where we're, we will be going next. And our focus is now really to make stretch goals versus just typical growth progress. So what are we doing to respond to this data? We are continue, continuing to use those diagnostics and from the diagnostics, they produce tools for instruction. We are using them for math and ELA and K to eight. Those tools for instructions are allowing our teachers to really focus in on some small group instructions that's very personalized and focused around specific gaps that students are, that still they still have. Um, on that underlying skill to make sure that while we're teaching on grade level, we're supporting them the right way in the on-ramp. For K to five mathematics, they have their individual pathways. So the students are getting 30 to 45 minutes that's really directed, personalized around where they need. Um, students who are below grade level are getting really reinforcements on their pathways and students that are at their grade level and above are getting enrichments and extensions through those pathways. So those are exciting pieces to be able to offer even our advanced learners. They are getting opportunities to stretch and grow themselves. Our middle school intervention added the iReady pathways this year. So that is the support tool for students that are in the intervention programs there. Our mathematical um, professional learning is supporting small group instruction rotations regularly at the secondary level. So last year, we really embraced it more in the middle school. This year, the focus is really expanding and using it more even in our high school levels as well. We've continued our focus around um, the student experience of tasks and building models and reasoning so that students are really seeing math in context versus just individual rote practice and routines. Professional learning is around building thinking classrooms. There's been some great research that has come out and results from building thinking classrooms. And it's really about the engagement level of students exploring mathematics learning in a little different way than just sit and get at their tables and um, in direct lecture type activities. We have an extensive program monitoring that we do in the schools. We are now going in in teams and we're really focusing on our co-teaching models within the schools at the middle and high school level. The team goes in, we visit many classrooms, we talk to the teachers, we talk about what our next steps of instructional focus. We really look at um, the mathematical understanding for both the content teacher and the special education teacher. MSDE is offering many different PD components uh, around mathematical reasoning. And in the spring, they are offering OGAP training, which is really a critical um, skill set in training teachers to recognize what are trajectory trends when a student shows a certain misconception, how do we directly teach to have students fill in that misconception and reteach so that they're learning correctly. And that brings me to the close of my components, but do you have any questions for me in regards to our math progress and data? I just have a question about the grade eight. It seems as if our grade eight math seems except, exceptionally low compared to our other math levels. So that that is across the state in all the counties because what we have to remember is that our highest achieving students are in Algebra 1 in eighth grade. And so really the students that are taking MCAP 8 are often our, our struggling learners um, and have some other misconceptions and some other struggles in some of their math concepts. And so sometimes that is all from the time I've, count, I've come into the county. That's really been a core focus area because it's not just a here thing. It is, it's across the board because as you have students that are moving to Algebra 1, their scores automatically now count for the high school. And the only thing that you're seeing in there are 
the smaller percentage of students that are in math eight. We have close to 40, 30 to 40 percent of our students are completing algebra one um, by the time they finish eighth grade. And, and a kudos note I, I want to recognize, we did have one school that 96 percent of their eighth graders had a three or four on their MCAP. Um, and so that is just, again, commitment to the dedication and, and the teachers and really building those relationships that kids want to, I'm going to do it for my teacher kind of a thing. Other questions? Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank no, you. It's very... disappointing though about the 725 that that was mandatory. I mean, I'm not sure well, at what level. Actually, they there's a lot of developments on that. Um, the state board just came out, actually, their last meeting with a report. They had, because the math scores across the state of Maryland have been so poor, that they asked for an investigation and a report to go out and see, you know, are, is that point of 750 accurate? Does it accurately capture a student who would be go on to be successful? Because that's what your college and career readiness, that CCR mark, mm -hmm. is a marker that says we can kind of guarantee that this kid is going to be successful as they move on, regardless of what they do, mm -hmm. because they have met this mark. So what they did was they determined they they looked at that 750 mark, they looked at the 725 mark, and they went out to see how many of those students have been successful after they left if they had a 725. And believe it or not, a lot of students were extremely successful. Right. And so they've kind of backed down, They're, they've changed their thought pattern a little bit to do we just look at a single test as an indicator for CCR or can is there an opportunity to look at a student's GPA, which is a very powerful indicator of whether a student's going to be successful. Um, at Chesapeake College, we have a MOU with them. Our students go there. Um, we fought years and years and years and got it accomplished just before COVID where students actually they use their GPA as opposed to a single test score coming into Chesapeake College for us to predict whether they're going to be successful in dual enrollment. And we've been very successful with that. And so the state now is kind of shifting gears a little bit. I think they're going to change um, that the CCR markers to include other opportunities such as, again, GPA and whether they got an A, B, or C in their algebra class. Um, so they're going to look at some variation of that, and, and hopefully John is here, John Groh is here, he's our accountability person. Hopefully I've captured that, um, if you wanted to add another comment. Well, no, uh, if you want to look at yeah. it, they're still talking about, and, and it's going to be uh, at the next the December state board meeting. There'll be more information on that. Okay, so he said at this December state board <laughs> meeting there'll be additional information on that. And Dr. Kibler also would like to weigh in. Yeah, sure. I just wanted to uh, <coughs> kind of piggyback on that and, and a comment that Ms. Smith made about the how the score is not necessarily a graduation requirement right now, and, and students kind of know that, and you're right. still trying to con convince them to get to that, or why they want a certain score, or then why they want to maintain the GPA of 3.0. It's really a mutually beneficial to the student and the school system that they get that CCR standard, because that what unlocks like the blueprint requirements of dual enrollment and the post CCR pathways to go into the CTE programs and things like that. So although it's not necessarily tied to that graduation requirement, it's extremely important to the second part of their high school career to get to that CCR uh, mark. And that also is funding for the district as they get there too. So with that we can provide those CTE opportunities and the dual enrollment opportunities too. So we do, do anticipate some changes to come yeah. down and, and actually fairly soon um, to help us prepare for the following year. You know, we're currently in public comment at the state level in regard to the multiple different options that are ahead of us. I did not talk about that because there are multiple different options that are ahead of us. And so um, I have a meeting Friday with this, no, tomorrow with the state in um, the math office, and they're supposed to share some components with us, and then I'll be able to create my statements to towards public comment, but I have not posted my total feelings yet because I wanted to make sure that I have other pieces that are coming from the math office um, as far as where their direction is pushing um, because the math office team there is, is really a strong dynamic team um, and they really do look for what is best for students and so um, but I know many of my counterparts across the state are actively writing their public responses mm -hmm. to advocate for scores that 
appropriately demonstrate students' understanding as well as different options because I am so much an advocate for students to have options ahead of them. And I think sometimes there's a there's an image of if they're doing this, it's oh, that they're college ready. And if they can be successful here, it's more about that it's not just a college. It's that if a student really has a picture of in mind a career route and they're in a CTE program, that they have that capacity. And I think sometimes right now the way the dynamic of the test is portraying, it doesn't actually share a balanced view that all students having those different opportunities ahead of them. Okay, I guess I'm, I'm I, I guess I was thinking when initially they had the 725 and Dr. Stalins, you were saying that people with that 725 were very successful and they had to have it. And we have such high graduation rates in our two high schools. So I'm assuming all of our high school students had to get a 725 if that was the theory, I mean, of so yes um but to not have a goal i guess i'm saying is why would they think that was good to take away a bar <laughs> you know so that now you can get a 710. Okay. they ratcheted it up actually so when they set the standards they said from this year to this year or the this span yeah. of time it was they had to get a 725 and then they moved it and and that's where the the controversy came from um, and and, the and we were actually yeah. we were actually on track for the 750 because the 750 was the goal mm -hmm. on the prior assessment platform, and when we had three bars right. of making what was, and we were right in track for that. We were set that our students were not going to have any problems hitting the 750, but then the pandemic hit and they changed the test and we changed the platform. And so that target's now very much- Not aligned. Yes. Sure. That's the bottom line is that it, it is not aligned to where it needs to be. And once it gets aligned, I think we'll be better. Yes. But, you know, and I thank you for pulling this together because I did mm -hmm. ask that to put it on. The board didn't ask for, you know, this. I asked to put it on because I did have concerns about the math and I wanted to make sure the board knows that we are well aware of it. We are addressing it, but there's also some dynamics around it as well. So um, I thank you for your leadership yes, with thank it. Thank you. I nominate you as well. <laughs> we just need one more. I don't want to get a mistake. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Do you want this closed okay. down then? There. All right. Thank you. Thank again. you. Have a good thank evening. You, thank you. Thank you, you too. 6.03, Charter School Notice, Miss Kate Boland. Can we bring up another chair for Mr. Uh, sure, Mr. Dr. Kimmler's. Thank you. Oh, no, okay. He's, he's all right, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for Mr. having us on, on the agenda. Um, we're, it's fascinating to hear all of what's been going on. So we'd like to tell you the uh, proposal that we are working on and we think we'll provide uh, an alternative for parents uh, in selecting you know, an education path for their students. Uh, it's not meant to imply in any way that uh, you're not on a path that's uh, obviously having some success, sure. uh, but there are some gaps in proficiency as you're aware of and you're talking about uh, uh, this evening. And we think the methodology that, that uh, the charter, the classical charter uh, curriculum and approach takes uh, will provide an opportunity to close that gap uh, to, to whatever yeah. extent we can. Anyway, Ms. Chairman Schifanelli and Dr. Salines and Dr. Sprangle and members of the board, we're very, very pleased to be here. We thank you for your time and your interest. Um, we're volunteers and we are interested in providing an enhancement to the Queen Anne County school system. I'm a former teacher. I taught first grade and uh, phonics was a standard when I was teaching school. And I know that you're now introducing phonics again. It was a proven method. And uh, in my opinion, it's unfortunate that uh, it was abandoned for many years, but happy to see that it's coming back. 
I um, am very involved in this, and I uh, people ask me, Audrey, what are you doing? You know, starting a charter school in Queen Anne County. I live here. I care about this county. I care about our future, and especially I have grandchildren, and uh, that's kind of the incentive for I think a lot of people. But my my concern is the proficiency rates, and I know that the pandemic had something to do with it, but the pandemic had something to do uh, in all countries. And I just read an article recently where uh, the United States has always been one of the top three, China, Russia, and the United States as far as um, academics and education um, proficiency. And if you haven't heard this, it's really alarming. It's very, very critical in my opinion. It's even a national security issue that we are now 37 in the world, 37 in the world, the education system in the United States of America, math, science, and language arts. It is very distressing. And when I found that out and when I heard that, and I also discovered what the proficiency rates were in most public school systems, not Queen Anne County is fairly good, but relatively speaking, uh, the proficiency rates are not where they should be. And more than half of the students are not at grade level in the elementary grades, uh, K through five. And that's alarming. And that's when I decided I had to do something. And I think everyone feels the same way. We all are in this together. We have to do something and you're doing whatever you can. But I just think there's more that can be done uh, with maybe perhaps uh, different approaches and different teaching methods and some traditional uh, classic um, uh, subject matters like Western civilization and um, a focus on uh, founding fathers and history, geography, some of these subject matters that really have um, taken a back seat in many, many years um, of our public education. And so I did some research and it's, it's all out there. It's all factual, it's all public record. What schools are performing? What schools have students that are at grade level? And in every case, it's either the private schools where parents are working two and three jobs to put their children through school to get the kind of education that they feel is um, their children deserve, or it's charter schools. I didn't know anything about a charter school. I hadn't been involved with charter schools, but I became convinced. And Kate and I have visited most of the charter schools in Maryland. I just have to mention there's two in Frederick that are well established and are very, very successful. And it's just something that I thought might be something that would work here in Queen Anne County. It would be the first one on the Eastern Shore and it would be a leader. Queen Anne County has been the leader in many ways, and this would just be another feather in the cap of the Queen Anne County public school system. We have worked very, very hard establishing a base. We have an advisory committee that's impressive and very, very hard working. Dr. Grasmick is on our advisory committee, and uh, we have uh, gone to all the different organizations. Uh, I've gone to the American Legion, to the Elks, to the Rotary, uh, because there's many grants that are available for charter schools, many. There's a National Charter School Alliance. There's a state, Maryland Nash, uh, Charter School Alliance. They all have grants and ready to assist and help us um, succeed. But most of them require matches. And so what I've been doing is requesting funding from these different organizations. And they've all been very, very generous and help, uh, helpful in that endeavor. So we uh, come to you as part of the process and we thank Dr. Salins for putting us on the agenda. Uh, this is the first step. We are to come before the Board of Education and announce our intentions. It's almost like a marriage. And <laughs> we, really, we really see it as that. It's a partnership. We, we want to partner with you to improve the school system so it can be the best in the state and even, even more than that, the best in the region. Um, anyway, I am enthusiastic. I've devoted a lot of time, energy to this, and I commit to continuing to do that until we succeed. I, I know that we need your um, approval. We have the application, and we've met with Dr. Sullivan's twice now, and we've been told that the uh, application is a little out of date. Uh, it's never been used, 
And so uh, we're going to be the guinea pigs, and um, they're updating it, which is uh, more than overdue, uh, but that would be uh, helpful to have something that's current. And uh, we're working to complete the application. The pre-application has to be submitted on March um, 14th, and the um, application has to be submitted on May 14th, 15th. Well, I'm going to get it here a day early just to make sure. <laughs> uh, but anyway, that's what, we're got, that's what we're aiming for. That's what we're working toward. And uh, we hope that obviously we'll have your support and your um, advice and your guidance. And you are the experts. Uh, we are the lay people, but we intend to become experts and to um, help you in any way that we can to see that this becomes a reality. Excellent. And Maryland is a charter school state. Um, as a board of education, we are obligated in certain ways to, to assist whenever we can. Um, but it really is an entrepreneurial endeavor that you're, you're getting into. Absolutely. And I commend you for it and, uh, and wish you the best of luck. Um, hopefully you get that application all in order and, and get it to us and we'll review it. If it's, I'm not even sure what our roll in is it you know in that is and what we review and how we approve it or or whatever but we'll figure it out well we do know that you have the approval authority that's, that's all i need to know dr kerwick since we're because i believe that the charter school policy is coming up shortly is that correct for review yes i i don't remember thing? exactly if it if it was on this year's calendar i believe it is and we we put that off uh, a few months because they're working on updating the application with it. But okay, yes. so is the application a part of the policy? I haven't even looked at it yet, so. Oh, yeah, the, the so the way it was posted on our website before, so we have the, the charter school policy, which I believe came just from MSDE. Okay. So we're, we're looking to see if there's been updates to that. That's part of the process for the year. And the application was attached to that policy. Okay. So yes. As an FYI, we're using the existing application because we need something. We have a copy of the state application, which is a model, and then we have a copy of your application. We're using your application to help us um, complete the sections. And as they change, as Dr. Salians told us, mostly what's changing is updating is um, uh, dates, uh, terminology, uh, those kind of things. It, the actual policy won't change. All right, and just to not give you the wrong impression, when you do come and we do review it, it obviously obviously takes a vote of the board, and um, but we'll give it a fair fair review and and do our yeah, uh, packets brought, for you. Yeah, yeah, we brought some packets that have some information. The school we're working on is a classical charter school, so it has a particular uh, type of approach that's established or well mm -hmm. known and utilized. So I have information in there about that, how we would uh, structure the curriculum and essentially the philosophy. And then a couple of the articles that Audrey uh, mentioned, including one that's uh, somewhat long, uh, but uh, uh, very interesting and includes some case studies of why charter schools are a good alternative. Uh, so I hope you'll find it interesting. It could be bedtime reading or not, uh, <laughs> however you choose. But. Hope it won't put you to sleep. Yeah. All right. And if you have any questions, any questions at all, obviously we are here to answer them. If we don't have the answer, we'll get the answer. And also I just want to say publicly in the community, if there's anyone who's interested or want to get involved, we're open for anybody and we would like to have um, anyone who cares to uh, let us know and get in touch with me, Audrey Scott. Okay, thank you very, very much. All right, thank, thank you, you ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to 6.04, cursive writing curriculum discussion. And this is a board discussion. Anybody want to open up the discussion? Well, I'll start. No. <laughs> so um, I thought we should open this back up since we had brought it up before. I know we all mentioned something. I know we've all heard stuff from members of the public, from parents. Um, just thought it would be a good idea to circle back and discuss it, discuss it openly. Um, 
I personally spent the past couple of months diving into a ton of research and filling up a notebook full of ideas and looking at research studies and clinical studies, um, anywhere from older studies to newer imaging studies of the brain. So um, I chose to kind of stick with one avenue because there were so many different, um, so much information, it was going to be, you know, hard to divulge it all. So I stuck with um, brain function and how learning to read and write cursive um, is very important. So I did write, I took about a notebook full of notes and condensed it down into three or four pages. So it's a ton of information. Um, if you guys give me about three, four minutes, I think I can <coughs> divulge into it if <laughs> you don't mind. Um, so let me start. Uh, the increase in digital devices and technology in the classroom has caused cursive handwriting to fall from importance. Accumulating evidence has shown that not learning to read or write cursive at a young age has hindered the brain's optimal potential to learn and remember. Scientists have discovered that learning cursive is an imperative tool for cognitive development, training the brain to learn functional specialization, the capacity for optimal efficiency. It integrates sensation, movement, control, and thinking. Brain imaging studies reveal multiple areas of the brain become co-activated during the learning of cursives, as opposed to typing, print, or visual practices, since fine motor control is needed to write in cursive. Research has also shown the act of physically gripping a pen or a pencil while practicing the swirls, curls, and connections involved in cursive because it activates parts of the brain that leads to increased language fluency. This naturally allows the child to take advantage of their abilities to control their fingers and are the building blocks for future fine motor dexterity. Studies done in conjunction with spe special education teachers and occupational therapists have noted learning cursive is a valuable tool when confronting dyslexia and disorders in letter formation, spacing, spelling, legibility, rate of writing, grammar, and composition. Teachers have also noted exercises as cursive were excellent in grounding the students' energies when confronted with behavioral problems. Cursive also supports self-esteem building because the area of the brain known as the limbic system is engaged in positive linguistic exercises. Uh, cursive stimulates brain synapses and synchrony between the left and right hemispheres, which is absent during typing and print. Cursive is faster and provides students with a personal style and ownership of their writing and has been shown to increase problem solving and abstract thinking. The same benefits can be seen when comparing cursive to learning to play an instrument as it trains the brain to integrate visual and tactile information. John Hopkins published a study recently showing the brains actually change during physical cursive lessons through, this was shown through emission topography scans showed during the brain structure and demonstrated that these changes resulted in almost an immediate improved fluency as lessons progress. In our digital world of technology, cursive has been a priority and we risk losing the ability to write by hand for future generations. We need to incorporate both, like the 21 other states that still include cursive in their curriculum. There is no argument when cur cursive has been shown to activate a unique circuit important in early recruitment of letter processing regions of the brain known to, under, excuse me, known to underlie a successful reading career. Um, there was also a bunch of comments that I wrote down, um, different websites I found on um, just articles and teachers unions websites. Um, so it seemed like most teachers were either team keyboarding, team cursive, or both. Um, I didn't do uh, the both, I more of, or the team keyboarding, I stuck with the cursive. So um, I just wrote down like, uh, they're quick quotes. So many states are bringing cursive back into the curriculum. Students like learning cursive and engages them. Uh, a teacher commented he brought future historians on a field trip and they could not read historical documents. There is a vast difference um, in reading a document in cursive as opposed to a PDF copy. Uh, in essay writing, it allows students to focus on cohesion of an idea and many students struggle with typing out their thoughts on a computer screen. Uh, one teacher noted, why aren't we teaching basic skills? Um, my middle school students can barely print properly. They don't know any cursive at all. And they are still hunting and pecking on the computer keyboard. Um, 
and she wanted to know why Common Core standards were to prioritize technology and students can't type on a keyboard. Uh, students were found to write faster and took better notes and expressed more ideas. Uh, one teacher wanted to know who will decipher and interpret public documents, diaries, and fam family documents and how easily things can be distorted. Uh, and one that kind of stuck out, one of the teachers quoted, uh, students, many students he has come across cannot read or write cursive. And as a society, it separates us from what has come before and understanding our origins and the meaning of them. So um, I did find some other correlations that were pretty neat um, when you guys brought up gender gap studies before with looking at different parts of the brain itself and um, how boys and girls learn different and different learning techniques that um, they've seen through brain imaging where uh, boys and girls will, um, they would pop on different scans of who was learning and how they were learning. So I just thought all this information uh, was very fascinating and just wanted to jot it all down and listen to everybody else's thoughts. So. I didn't get into Thank it you for listening as, to me. <laughs> as Alexis, but I think I read the same one about team keyboarding and, and, <laughs> and team cursive. And uh, yeah, I agree. I mean, the, what I would read was it just that the functional specialization, especially the memory, um, the retention, that because when you type down verbatim, they said frequently people on keyboards would type stuff down verbatim, wouldn't remember anything. But if you had, when you're writing it, you kind of have to paraphrase, you kind of have to just jot your short notes, and then when you go back through it, and review it and change it, that helps you remember it. Um, the only thing negative that I read at all, because I did read a little bit about team keyboard, is just the, your time. And I was like, it's not as if our kids don't have enough screen time, so how wonderful another benefit was to take them off the screen. Um, and I mean, now they have blue glasses so that you don't freak out your eyes, right, with the, um, so much screen time to make them write something on the paper. But I think it's, a, um, it's great, to, it would be nice to join uh, the 21 states, even if we're just the county. It was amazing to see how they showed some of the work in some of the clinical studies um, for kids who have dyslexia, and they showed their print versus their cursive, and it was just amazing. Like, you know, they could barely print, but their cursive was legible, and there was it was just eye-opening. So I don't think anybody um, thinks it's a bad idea, but do we know why it was removed? because they wanted to prioritize technology. That's why it was removed from, they wanted to look ahead for the future. I, that was a whole nother subject I didn't want to get into, but it says it was removed to prioritize technology. You didn't do a good job at prioritizing technology. Yeah. <laughs> Over the past 10, 15 years, I guess, a lot of the school systems around the nation have um, dropped cursive writing. And I guess in the last three or four years, a lot of school systems are realizing that was probably a mistake and they're putting it back into their curriculums. And, um, and obviously that's not a reason for us to do it just because everybody else is doing it or a lot of other school districts are doing it. Um, I do understand that it does develop fine uh, motor control. Um, you know, on the other hand, I, I do know that we implement things that uh, develop motor control as well, fine motor control um, uh, exclusive of, of cur uh, cursive writing. But I, I do recall when I was running for the Board of Education, um, that was a topic, at least on social media. Um, I think the women, uh, League of Women Voters had asked some questions, you know, would you bring cursive writing back in? And one of the examples that I um, brought up was as a Boy Scout Scoutmaster, um, I was out with the, the boys a lot, and uh, part of their program is writing um, work requirements for merit badges and, and that sort of thing. And uh, I don't know if it was just my boys or whatever, but they wanted to get that stuff done fast because right. it's not the most exciting thing about scouting. Mm -hmm. And they were printing and uh, I would get their printed work and you know they're trying to move so fast, maybe their brains are going fast and that they just couldn't keep up with the printing. So it actually looked like cursive, but it wasn't. It was a lot of it was <laughs> Ill illegible. Um, so that's just an anecdotal uh, story there, but um, you know, it, it's something that um, we need to consider. And I think that the proper procedure would be to give the public notice if someone is inclined to um, make a motion that we change the curriculum to include cursive writing. 
And I believe it's only, what, in third grade? Is that when they, they begin to learn cursive? Um, and that sort of thing, right? And it's not a year-long thing. It, it's, it typically is. Is it? Actually. Okay. It was in the curriculum as a year-long opportunity. Oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So they practice it. Yeah. I, it was a long time ago when I <laughs> learned it, so I can't remember how I learned it. But uh, um, so the proper procedure would be to, to give the public notice, put it on the agenda, and whoever wants to make that motion or resolution, whatever, um, we'd have another discussion at that time and make a vote on it. Um, I would also like to hear, uh, you know, I've heard from the superintendent. We've discuss, discussed yeah, it offline. Did. Yeah, mm -hmm. just you and I. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think it would be beneficial to hear from them, from the um Let me share uh, some of the things the that staff. we talked about. Yeah, talk or about. you can Or do you want to do it next time? It, you can, it, we're having a discussion now, so if it's, it's however okay. you want to. Okay, I mean, yeah, I'm happy to share. So I'll just share what I shared with um, sure. our president in a conversation. Um, it was removed because we are in a digital age. Um, we are developing digital literacy. Uh, I, I don't discredit any of the research that, that's been presented this evening, but I will say that there's research on the other side of it as well, like there always is on two, two different sides. So I'd like to present a little bit of that. Um, just like President Schipanelli said that we, we do understand that it has to do with fine motor skills and as a matter of fact, developmentally speaking, that's why it doesn't start till third grade because it's a fine motor thing. Um, but we do have several things in our curriculum that we, that we have enhanced um, to be able to increase fine motor, op fine motor opportunities, um, everything from puzzles to drawing to musical instruments and things like that. Um, I think it's important for us to understand too that research shows that 77% of Americans, and this is last year's data, so it's probably a little higher, but 77% of Americans own a smartphone and use it as their primary means of communication. Um, and so I think that's important to understand all of every, all the print that our students read with the exception of um, some documents that would be aged, um, but the books that they use are all block writing. And I don't want any misconceptions out there that we don't have students write, that they're only getting screen time because they do write, they learn how to block write, um, which is, you know, your, your um, printing. And they, and they do a lot of writing in school. And I don't want that misconception to get out that our students aren't writing because they, they aren't using cursive handwriting. Um, I will say that there's two other districts on the shore that do have um, it in their curriculum as part of their third grade, and that's Cecil County and Caroline County. Um, and the rest of them have, have eliminated it from their programming. It is extremely time consuming to do. It's not an easy task. If you do stretch your mind back of when you learned, it's, it's a very challenging and difficult difficult thing to do um, with the increase in standards and the changes and the expectations and the mandates that we have it's very difficult to squeeze it into our curriculum because of the intense time that it takes to really teach it um, i think when we look at where our students are headed um, we talked about digital signatures i know that that to me has been a, the most of the parent concerns not necessarily the developmental pieces which were good pieces that you brought up today but most of them are like i want my child to be able to have a signature well we're moving to an age of digital signatures everything that we do is digitally signed now um, even our evaluations are digitally signed we just got them on board for that so that is the way of the world is going to a digital signature um, everything is online and those smartphones and those devices are what our students use. Um, so I do, I, again, appreciate the research, and I know there's plenty of research to show um, uh, the positive aspects of it, but I also know that there's as much research on the other side that shows that we are moving through a digital age, that we are building digital literacy, and that there's um, more than just one way to actually communicate, which would you know, not just be in cursive, obviously. So. Um, but again, I think you're exactly right. We need to go through the process. We need to put it out and, and hear from, from parents. From the so, public. Yeah. Sure, yeah. like we always do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that and I think, <laughs> of course, I'll date myself, but you go back and look at old deeds and stuff. There's a certain point where they're handwritten, and you've right. got to be able to read that. Right. Probably nine out of ten people don't do that. They don't re go back that far. You don't have to go back 60 years and do a title search right. anymore. Right. So that it's irrelevant there. But it's. I always thought, it's something you need to know. I mean, that's how you got to, but you know, then I can say you get a Christmas card. Nobody writes Christmas cards anymore, you know. Uh, not, many. not many, not like they used to. Uh. But <laughs> I think we need it. I just, my question would be, can we fit it in? And you know, it's like a five gallon bucket. 
It only holds five gallons. Yeah. You know, I would love to have it, mm -hmm. but I'd also like to find out what would be take away. And it might be a, it might be a decision this board makes is it's worth taking it away. Mm -hmm. But we need to find out what we're going to do. It's just not something that just come out and have it too. I think we're going to have to not lose something, but we're going to have to. Adjust. downscale something and I'd like the board to also just entertain the concept that you know if we were able to provide resources for parents to be able to pursue that if they so wish to pursue that and provide them with opportunities I mean we have a lot of opportunities especially through iReady um, where students do work outside of school yep. um, to build certain skill sets and so you know I don't know how it will go but but I'd like to see that as an option on the table um, when we do discuss it with parents, that is, is that a viable option to be able to offer these outside opportunities um, for students to access specific resources that we would provide for them? Mm -hmm. So um, I'd, I'd like to just put that out there mm -hmm. in case we can't or in case the board decides there isn't anything that we can take off the plate. You know, if that's the case, could we have an alternative? Um, so I'd like to just keep that on as an idea out right. there. Mr. Smith, you bring up a very valid point. I have had discussion with staff about where it would actually fit in. Um, time is a, is a big concern that we have with all the other standards that we have to present in English language arts. It's just, it's going to, it will cause a big carve out. And so what will we be missing with that? I mean, that's, I think, something that as a board member, I would ask the question is, I, I like it, I think it's a good idea, mm -hmm. but what we can we afford it? And I mean, when I say afford it, time, can we afford the time to yeah. do that uh, would be my question. And then we can make it a, a decision on, you know, well, yeah, we, we, will, we won't, you know, but I, I hear all these things changing and the math scores and this and that and mm -hmm. you know then all of a sudden well okay you're taken away from, what do you mean taken away from? It's, it, it, there's only so many hours in a day mm -hmm. and they're in school. Um, that's pretty unique to sit there and say, you know, you could have a separate program where parents could actually and, and do some extra stuff. Yeah. But then I sit there and think, if we're going to do it right, we got to offer it to everybody. And, and that's when you really start dividing people because there'll be some that are ability to do it and some don't have the ability to do it. And that, cons that would concern me somewhat too. Not, you know, but. So in, in your concept of um, kind of not, you know, putting it out there, are you thinking of like a survey where you would want um, you know, because we've done surveys, especially like the calendar is a perfect, um, mm -hmm. a sure. perfect example of that, where we'll send out um, Dr. under Dr. Kibler's um, leadership, he'll send out the three calendars and ask the community to kind of weigh in and vote. Is that your, is that what you were thinking? I wasn't thinking anything at the point of time, <laughs> how logistically okay. it would be done. But um, yeah, because other times we've put, well, action items, you know, that have right. been out and people can make comments, but we've also done it that way before. And I think that would be great. Um, okay. or any way to do it. I mean, so I was gonna let Dr. the rest Kibler of the board man. Yeah. is yeah. fine with that. I was just going to say, if we would do something like that, like in a survey, my, my experience and kind of statistical background would just say, like, we can't just put a question out and say, would you like to see cursive writing added back in the curriculum? Sure. Just like you couldn't do that for any topic because you'll get people just yes or no. We, I think we would need to put the caveat in there with Dr. Sprankle's team of what we might propose would have to be missing or you, you need Close. to make sure that you're you're putting in there somehow this is what the ramifications of, right. of a decision like th that would be I think like would you be willing to give up this to have this or do you think correct and I mean and I mean it can start just yeah. would you be yeah. supportive of putting cursive writing into the curriculum okay. you can just say that yes or no mm -hmm. but there needs to be another know. question underneath that then says okay if you answered yes and we're going to do that here are some pro here are the ramifications which pieces of that do you or do you not support um you know mm -hmm. for making how about if how about if um we come up with a, a recommended survey and the board review that survey and, and determine whether um or tweak you know what i mean mm -hmm. determine sure. some comments and and suggestions for changes to it but if we could just come up with at least a good structure to start with like mm -hmm. a springboard for you mm -hmm. sure some kind of notice that the board is potentially going to consider this and uh, and um, yeah you know, would it be beneficial would to be have any hyperlinks in it as well that to take us to some uh, surveys or I mean some uh, <coughs> websites that would have studies or anything you know information they could read about pros and cons of it as of course. well if they I mean, maybe we could tap into 
some of the uh, uh, literature that Miss Capes found too. Like all that couple hundred pages. I'm not going to. I'm not going to type or write it all, but I could. I could link it. I, I kind of. I guess I, I thought of a nice example, maybe to support what I was saying. It goes before our state legislature almost every year to put a high school graduation requirement of a financial literacy course. Oh, and everybody is very supportive of that idea. But one of the reasons it doesn't pass is because then they think about all their graduation requirements that we already have. And what are you willing to take away to put that course in? And and so those kind of you, you have to balance the argument. Everybody's kind of supportive of it. But then when you think about the ramifications, then people kind of back off. And that's I just think we need to make sure we're considering both pieces of that. Right. So we need to know. Again, what the cost is, sacrifices, Dr. Sparkle said, um, yes. what that is. So the public knows, obviously, so we know. Do we think that this might be something for our CAC to um, help out with in some kind of way, too? I don't I know, mean, you know, if we run it by them first or... Sure, I, mean, I don't know. When I, don't, it, I don't want to put you on the spot, but when's your next meeting? November 29th. Okay, so maybe we could have a draft and allow them to have some weigh in and, they, sure. and then that information could also come to the board. Okay. Before you just put it out there. Right. Yeah, I mean, that, that gives us probably enough time to work on questions, run it by them, and then it'd be a quick turnaround to get it on the agenda for the next, because I guess the board meeting would be the next week. But we yeah, well, that's. Number six. Mm -hmm. We can, we can, we'll do our best. We'll do our best. Well, yeah. Right. And let, let's. If we need to slow down a little right. bit to do it right, then we can do that too. We're not, I don't think it's a race here for the finish line, but uh, obviously it is an important issue and whoever put it on the agenda, thank you for doing that. Um, all right. Any other questions? Okay, moving on. Well, 6.05, <laughs> Citizens Advisory Council. That's a good segue. Dr. Kimbler. Speaking of the Citizens Advisory Council. <clears throat> Good evening, President Schickmelli, Dr. Salins, board members and executive team. Uh, Dr. Matthew Kipler here to talk about uh, just an update on the Citizens Advisory Council and School System Improvement Committee uh, just to this point for the year. So we have had our first two meetings of the year so far, a uh, September 27th meeting and an October 24th meeting. Uh, we have added this to the website, so we have a dedicated Citizens Advisory Committee uh, page. It's linked under the About section. Um, and then under the Board of Education, since it is a committee for you all, uh, meeting agendas and minutes are, um, are posted uh, for you all to read or, or the public as well. I just wanted to cover a little bit of the topics that we talked about so far. So at our September meeting, first meeting of the year, we kind of we had some new members, some returning members kind of just gave a nice overview of the purpose of the groups. Uh, some new school year updates, summer happening, summer projects, uh, Mr. Pender's team, every, all the good work they did. Uh, talked a little bit about how we're going to try to uh, make the group more involved in the in policy review throughout the year. Um, Dr. Sprankel presented some new courses. Uh, to the to the groups to get them to weigh in and um, I sort of bolded that on my notes because you'll be looking at those under the action items later in the agenda um, so we're really excited to get those groups to weigh in on those courses before they came to you all um, and then we really spent some time just planning ideas topics uh, for the year at that September meeting the October meeting, it started uh, with a calendar discussion, school year calendar for uh, school year 24-25, started that planning. As well, you might remember from Dr. Salen's uh, gender gap presentation um, with kind of her directives to Dr. Sprankle and the CNI team, part of that was presenting the gender gap study at the October meeting to the CAC. Dr. Sprankle led the group in a nice activity, getting their reactions and some initial thoughts, and also let them know what the plan is for her team over the next several months researching, excuse me, uh, gender gap, the gender gap and, and potential um, things we can do in Queen Anne's County to close that. Uh, we will also, it, at the January meeting, ha Dr. Sprankle will kind of present the findings to that group before then that comes to you all, the board, um, in February with, with recommendations to present to you. 
uh, November, uh, there's a new, uh, new course coming up again. We'll continue the calendar discussion. We'll start to dive into uh, budget planning for next year as well. Um, when it comes to calendar, I just kind of wanted to, to get the opinion of, of the group while we're talking here too. You do have a calendar policy that says that the calendar committee will present three versions of the school year calendar and that you all would vote on one of those. Last year, what we did, the group worked on the calendar, made the, the, the three calendar um, drafts. I brought them here to show you, and then you ask for that to go out to a vote to the public. Um, the public actually voted for what the group's favorite option or preferred option was as well. I kind of just wanted your guidance for the group. Do you want to see the drafts before we send it out for public vote? Do we need to do a public vote on the three of them? That is not what the policy says, but what kind of your practice for the past few years, um, just kind of your ad advice for the group there. I thought it went really well last year. Yeah, I think the CEC it. comes up with three, send it out for, the, yep. you know, I, I like to start after Labor Day and finish before Memorial Day, but that never is going to happen. I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> say it over here, but I'm, I'm going to give up on that one. But uh, You do not have to give up on that, Mr. So, I won't give up on it, but it's a, it's a tough sell. So if, if it's the board's purview to survey, can Dr. Kibler just survey before he comes to you? Yeah. So yeah. he doesn't yeah, have to my, bring it to you, I, and then you say go survey as and one bring member, yeah. As one is member, I'd say right? it's fine. Okay. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to take that and run with it. I'm not yeah. going to take it yet, but I, no, I appreciate that. And we'll kind of look at timing. Um, I'm hopeful that at the November meeting, we'll uh, agree on the three versions and they can go ahead out to survey right then. If they'd like to look at it one more time uh, before I survey, we will. And then hopefully bring it back to you all for, in January or February for your vote. Um, and that'll be around the same time frame as last year, if not a month or two earlier, we're a little bit ahead of the process, which I think the public, and I hope you all appreciate. When you send it out, the, the three copies to the thing, can we get a copy just so we have it? Of course. Because my granddaughter could sit there and think I'm crazy <laughs> if I don't know what's going on. Sure, of course. <laughs> Might do, but. And I think what, I'll, what I'd like to do too, I think I did it last year when we put the vote out, I kind of hit a couple highlights in each just so people, you know, people public, they, they don't live in this every day like we do, just say like the first one preserves a spring break. The second one does start after Labor Day because I have, we will put an option out there because the CAC does want to see a calendar with that. Um, so so we give them what they ask for and then let the public kind and of. And the public knows we need 180 days. Correct. In school, 190 days with teachers. And uh, 89 now. 89. 189. 189 then. Yeah. It used to be 190, though. You're right. huh? It was 190 before I came here. You cut us a day? No, I didn't. No, you can't. I mean, it was one, and then they changed it, I think, right before I got here. Sid would know this. That's correct. That. Okay, thank you. So, yeah, and then the January meeting, I did mention the gender gap, continue the budget discussion and uh, capital improvement planning as well and kind of how it relates to the budget planning. So that's kind of the next couple months of review. But it's been great uh, really trying to um, – get the groups involved and make sure that it's not just um, us as employees and board member talking to the groups, but getting their input on topics. And I, I think it's been uh, well received. I hope Mr. Smith, Ms. Bennett, and Dr. Sprankle would, would agree. Um, yes. there, it's, it's hard to get through the agendas quickly. Um, they're, they're always packed. So mm -hmm. we'll add cursive writing to this too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any okay. questions on that? Anina, no questions? All right. Thank you. Acceptable use of technology and electronics, Dr. Kibler. Hmm. So I'll just say right here. Yeah. Um, so I do have two policies. The first one is the acceptable use of electronics uh, policy. So what we're bringing tonight is a first read of this policy to make a few edits to it. So I did present at the work session a policy review calendar for the year. So we're in this first month of that. So this acceptable use of electronics policy is kind of overseen by a few uh, departments jointly, uh, accountability department being one of them. Um, so I uh, offered to present it tonight. Again, this is a first read. Uh, no, no real major changes in this. You see the red line version. We've updated a link just to um, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act website. And then um, there are a few references to an old policy, an old cell phone policy, which is now called the Personal Electronic Device Policy. So just making that 
that change. Um, in an electronic communication paragraph, we added social media, um, but really the big change is just a couple updates on that uh, personal electronic device. So I, I can take any questions if, if you have them. We will present these policies to the CAC and SSIC for their comment. It'll be posted on the website uh, for public comment as well, and we'll come back next month for um, a so second read. It doesn't matter, just because normally it comes to us with the policy name on it, where this just says policy name, so just to make it easier to... Uh, that's just a right, style just... oversight. Okay, so. yeah. Sure. I know, I said it was a moot point, but just yeah, to no, catch it. No, no, we've got to get it right. Thank you. All right, questions? Mm -mm. All right, another uh, first read, student data governance and privacy. Dr. Kibler. So this is another policy that's uh, for first read that's over, uh, overseen kind of jointly between, uh, plays a part with our technology department, accountability department, as well as our student services department. Um, in this one, the only change we're proposing right now is a new MSDE is around a new MSDE mandate around the volunteer voluntary product accessibility template or VPAT for short. This is just really making sure that any new technology that we bring into the district uh, meets a set of standards for um, accept, um, uh, accessibility for our students with disabilities. We're really any student. Any student, yeah. Any student. And so we've made two uh, references to that redlined into the policy, just adding those in. And that is something that uh, we have to do. And I believe that was all we have there. All right, then move on to the next read, first read. Uh, minority business enterprise procedures for state funded public school sure. construction projects. And Dr. Kimbler, good evening, Mr. Barraclough. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Vice President Bennett, board members, Superintendent Salins, and the executive team. I'm Daryl Barraclough, school facility coordinator. I come before you this evening for the first read of policy 215, Minority Business Enterprise Procedures for State-Funded Public School Construction Projects. This policy would replace the obsolete July 2001 procedures that are currently on our website. In order to be in compliance with the Interagency Committee on School Construction's requirements to receive state funding, the requirements found throughout these procedures must be incorporated in the bid documents and contract. So I just I just want to add. So w w what we're proposing here, we we actually didn't even have a, a policy. All we had were these outdated procedures, and they weren't even updated from 2011. Procedure. 2001. They were 2001, but now there's a 2020 <clears throat> 20 procedure. So so this is going to put a policy in place as well as update the procedures. Bring the procedures current. Correct. Right. Great. Any uh, questions? No. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Now we're set to take a break, and we always ask at least the board members give us a thumbs up. Run it. Good. Yeah. Um, but you know what, staff? Does anybody want to take a break? Because we always <laughs> ignore the staff. I feel, uh, Mr. Bell, you need a break because you're coming up next. Sure. <laughs> All right, UAC TV doesn't need a break. All right. Well, if at some point you feel you need a break, take it. Oh, HR report first. Okay, uh, human resources substitute bus driver report. Uh, do I have a motion? And Mr. President, I move that we accept the HR report as presented. Second. Motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All right, good evening, Mr. Bell. First thing, new course approval, visual journaling. Yes, it's good evening, President. About that. Go ahead. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board, executive team. For the record, I'm Michael Bell, Supervisor of Visual and Performing Arts, K-12, Media, K-12, Title IV, Part A, and MSDE Fine Arts Grants. I'm here before you tonight to obtain approval for three new high school elective course offerings for the 2024-25 school year. You would like me to start with visual journaling? So, certainly. Visual journaling, our need for this course arose as our teams have been updating our pre K to 12 visual arts curriculum, where visual journaling is embedded as a curricular extension. Now, this course will actually be groundbreaking, as I think it's a first of its kind, not only in the state, but perhaps in the country. I don't 
think there's any other visual journaling courses out there and programs of study. It will help students interested in attending post-secondary colleges and universities to study visual arts, where there's a need for students to present quality visual journals when they do portfolio reviews in order to get into those colleges. It could also spark interest for students that are just interested in book arts while supporting literacy across the curriculum. And we do plenty of cursive in the visual journals as well. <laughs> so that's a little bit about the visual journaling course. All right, any uh, questions, concerns? Mr. President, I move to approve the new visual journaling one credit course for the 2024-2025 high school program of study. Second. All right, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank Is you, doodling Thank uh, you, President part of that? <laughs> Not doodling, doodling, doodling to, included to, in that? Am I visual? Uh, to a, a <laughs> high level, and if you can imagine, there's also traditional book arts where you can learn how to make them by hand, but there's also non-traditional books that could be made as sculptural, three-dimensional books. So there's lots of, if you come out to art scene, you're going to see a lot of the students' visual journals that are amazing in all kinds of shapes and forms. And it it's really a, journey through their thoughts as well as their process versus the final product, which is why it, it happens in their AP sustained investigations as well. They need those sketchbook pages that show evidence of the process. Didn't, didn't Please you tell him to work in math, right? Please tell yep. him doodling as part of the curriculum. Not for him. <laughs> didn't you just have a former student yeah. that graduated? We, we that did. Class. We did. So the, the, the student that was just in the newspaper recently, Claire Parker, who was a Queen Anne's County High School graduate, if you go on the QACPS YouTube page, you'll see a video of her talking about visual journaling. I interviewed her and she flips through the pages that led to the yeah, final yeah, products. That's exactly right. It's amazing. Cool. Oh, yeah, there she yeah, is. Man. Oh, look at that. Oh, amazing. We didn't have that planned, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> she just happened to have it. Oh, my desk. No, it's perfect. Yeah. No, thank you, though. Whatever. All right, thank you. Very excited. Okay, next uh, course approval, musical theater. All right. Mr. Bell. Thank you, President Schiavonelli. So our need for music, uh, musical theater course, that arose to build off of the music and theater arts courses that we've been building into our middle school programs so that those students also have a place to go. Currently, the only introductory course for students interested in theater at the high school level is introduction to theater. And from there, students can choose one or two tracks where they go actor studio one and two, or they go play directing, play production. So musical theater provides another option for students that it might, maybe they, it might not fit their mold to just jump right into introduction to theater. Maybe they, they love performing at the middle school. If you've been out to some of those middle school performances, I mean, those were amazing. So those students could jump right into musical theater. All right, I think uh, we should actually do the motion first, and then I think about it. Do I have a motion? Yeah, Mr. President, I move to approve the new Musical Theater One credit course for the 2024-2025 high school program of study. I have a second? Second. Okay, motion and a second. Do we have any discussion, questions? Nothing? All right. In that case, uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, President Schifanelli. Yep. The, moving on to the third one, string orchestra. So the need for a string orchestra course arose from interest that students who are working in strings at Sudlersville Middle School. And they've been working at it. This is the third year that we have students, a, a small group that have been performing with strings. So this would provide them a pathway when they, when they get to the high school level. Currently, we do not have a string orchestra course at the high school level. So there is a need for one, uh, not only for those incoming freshmen for the 2024-25 school year that gain an interest in middle school to have that pathway, but just for all students in general, if, if there's a need and there's students that could sign up for that course, then they would have that you know, option in their schedule. So it's an elective again as for string orchestra. All right, do you have a motion? Mr. President, I move to approve the new string orchestra one credit course for the 2024-2025 high school program of study. Second. All right, motion and a second. Do we have any discussion? Only question. Sure. And this is both schools. 
yes, the course, that when it goes in the program of study, it's offered for both schools, absolutely. Uh, you, when, I, I just, when you said Southern's well, I know they come up with certain things, but it goes to both and available to both. It would be available. What, you know, the, the first step is gaining the course approval. From there, we see if there's enough interest Any from school. both schools to take the course. If there is enough interest from both schools, the next step it would go to the high school principals to work out a schedule that would be conducive to be able to offer that course gotcha. at both okay. schools. Is Sellersville the only one that does strings right now? It is. It began as an initiative. It was a unique situation where Betsy Babylon happened to be a very talented instructor who came from a strings background. And so she had the ability to teach some students. Principal Watkins at the time went out and obtained grant funds in order to supply string instruments for students that uh, may not have been able to rent instrument, instruments uh, depending on their situation. And then I was able to also obtain a grant to keep that funding alive. And I continue to do so for the, the current eighth graders. And through Rick Stripmater at the Queen Anne's County Arts Council, we put together a grant for $20,000 for them to be able to do that. We just got approval from Rick Stripmater for an additional grant to help out any students that are unable to rent those instruments at the high school level for an additional $10,000 this year. Nice. So we'll be working with uh, Luke Whitehair, who I just launched on the podcast today. He's uh, offering to teach that course uh, next year at Queen Anne's County High School. Awesome. So. Yeah, Amazing. very exciting I, stuff happening. So. My daughter came home with a cello on her back and her book bag on her front. <laughs> kept on and told her to carry. I'm like, <laughs> thought you were playing violin. She's like, she said I had good cello arms. I'm like, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. She's amazing, and yep. and and I'm happy to to support that for those students. I think it's so important. Absolutely, very important. That's impressive. She can say you have a cello arm sound positive. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations to your daughter. It's awesome. Okay. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, Mr. Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have a Thank great you. evening. I can't wait to listen to the new podcast, yeah, too. Yeah. Shout it's out. exciting. Shout out to the podcast through our team. bag and her book bag on her front. Okay, Mr. Tolly, new course approval for project lead. Lead the way, computer integrated manufacturing. Yes, thank you. Good evening, President Schifanelli, Dr. Salins, members of the board, and executive team. For the record, my name is Adam Tolley, and I'm the supervisor of career and technical education. I'm here tonight to obtain approval from the board for a new um, CT course for the 2024 20, 2025 school year. Uh, that course is a, a course that is from Project Lead the Way, which we, which we offer at uh, both of our high schools and all four of our middle schools now. Uh, and the course is called Computer Integrated Manufacturing. Uh, this course would, would be offered at both schools. It's a course that um, only one other district on the Eastern Shore offers, so we would be the second one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's a course that we've been talking about for a little for a little while. It was um, we have two veteran instructors that teach our project lead the way engineering courses at both high schools, and you know first brought it up with them. They were super excited about that. They brought it up to their um, they all the CT pathways as you as you probably know have to have a program advisory committee, which is made up of businesses. Uh, college representatives, et cetera, they brought it up to their um, their program advisor committee in the spring, and they were very excited to hear that this would be a potential. I've talked to two representatives from um, very large manufacturing businesses in Queen Anne's County, and they're very excited about the potential of this course. And, and, and basically, this course really teaches about manufacturing, the history of manufacturing, um, but, the, you know, this is an advanced manufacturing course. You know, a lot of times when we talk about manufacturing, people have the idea of the old assembly lines, and, and that is so much far from the truth now. You know, our, our facilities are just absolutely amazing. And this course basically teaches them about the, you know, the robotics of manufacturing, how the machines are programmed. So there's, there's a lot to it which would really, um, you know, be a benefit for them when they go out into the workforce to have this, uh, to have this experience. Outstanding. Do I have a motion? 
Mr. President, I move to approve the new Computer Integrated Manufacturing Course for the 2024-2025 High School Program of Study. Second. Okay. Uh, any discussion, questions? I said one question. The two businesses you talked to, did they talk that they would be offering apprenticeships or uh, after? We've actually had the, the one business um, actually had, we had a youth apprentice. They were one of our first businesses. And the second business, we have students that are working there currently, both on opposite ends, one in Kent Island and, and one on the northern part of the county. So Great. it's it's very exciting. Can I just make Would there a be, mm -hmm. Would sorry. there be any certification at some point with, as we continue to evolve in this course? Yes, and that's, you know, that's a, a focus of, of ours for all of our courses as Blueprint, you know, really ramps up that that um, requirement that you know we offer certification so definitely a certification offered with that um, and and potentially you know we were going to offer this initially as an elective course um, but dr. Salins and I have had you know many comments and our, our conversations about potentially doing a, a total advanced manufacturing pathway so this is this is sort of our foray into that to, to start it out it was the um, really the easiest way to do it and Project Lead the Way offers some you know, excellent courses. So we, we were excited. And that's what I was, I was just gonna mm -hmm. say thank you, Adam, for your leadership with this because when I first came on board, my experiences and opportunities were for the full blown advanced manufacturing pathway, which was amazing and um, took many years to get, you know, to dig through there and get it to be approved. And Adam got it, ran with it and has just made it happen which is awesome and I'm, I'm so excited about it because it's bringing businesses into the school district and it's just another opportunity for our students to get such an amazing skill set for when they walk away um, and they work within our community. So Absolutely. thank you, thank you, and thank you. This is a, kind of a little passion for you. me and I really appreciate you pushing pushing for it. It's great and, and also, and then I'll, I'll close out, um, Chesapeake College is also beginning to start um, a manufacturing um, pathway, pathway of their own. Mm -hmm. So this is something uh, where I'm actually going to a meeting at Chesapeake this month to uh, it's a manufacturing consortium meeting. And um, so it's something that we would be able to partner with, you know, Chesapeake College that they could, you know, our students could leave here and then, you know, increase their education at Chesapeake with this. So That's awesome. thank you. I'm Great so excited about yeah. it, really. Yeah. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right, thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, any uh, citizen participation? Anybody signed up? No. Nope. Nope. Public comment? Okay, so the future meetings, um, the November 15th, 2023 uh, work session has been canceled. So the next meeting is going to be December 6th at 6 p.m., and that would be the open session. We may have a closed session before that. Motion to adjourn? Or anybody got anything else? No? no? Motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. Second. I moved. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you, everybody.